So going back to our discussion on kinetics, we had talked about, again, just the importance of forces in general, and we talked about force couples. So basically when you have different forces acting, going in different directions, but kind of all operating from the same point, you get this, this concept of a force couple where you get some, some rotary motion taking place. And this is what we have when we look at rotation of the scapula. So this is kind of a, a, a clinical application or a functional application of some of that earlier material that we had talked about. And you could see in the pictures here, on the left hand side of the screen, we have upward rotation of the scapula and the muscles that operate in the force couple to do that. And on the right side of the screen, you have the um, you have the downward rotation of the scapula and the muscles that work together to do that. So anytime you have you know two or more forces with a point of application, you get you get rotation taking place along the axis. So for the um, the upward rotation force couple on the left, you see a combination of the upper trap, the serratus anterior, and the lower trap. And then on the downward rotation, now there, there's actually one muscle not in the picture. Um, that's the levator scap, the levator scapula. So the levator scapula, the rhomboids in the pec minor work to do downward rotation. So we see this here. Now the, some of the, the significance of what goes on. So think about these muscles. So muscles that are weak, muscles that are tight, and what you see a lot of times in shoulder pathologies. So obviously we know that, again, the upper trap has to work, but sometimes the upper trap becomes very dominant. When you get weakness in the lower trap and the serratus anterior, you're not going to get that functional upward rotation. Plus it's very common for individuals to have tight pec minors. So again, if we kind of think about what goes on there um, functionally, that when we have pathologies with these overactive muscles and muscles that are weak, we can now kind of see a little better and you can kind of understand why certain muscles more commonly get strengthened in, in individuals with these shoulder pathologies. So very, very important that all these muscles kind of work together in producing these different motions. And here we're seeing more of that muscle synergy at the shoulder. So we're seeing the now here we're seeing the interaction between the deltoid and the rotator cuff as we move through different levels of abduction at the humerus. So again, it, if you remember going back to other picture kind of showing the, the, the force vectors that would occur, that if we only had heavy activation of the deltoid, you'd really be limited in the amount of functional elevation you'd have at the shoulder because again, the rotator cuff is going to be responsible for kind of helping to allow the humerus to rotate and keeping it depressed while you go through your full range of motion. Um, and again, all of the rotator cuff muscles do work to a significant level. Obviously, when we're looking at straight abduction, the supraspinatus is going to act very much so to help kind of keep the, the humeral head um, roll, allowing that roll and slide to occur at the humeral head to make sure that you're not getting um, increased upward, upward translation rather of the humerus kind of compressing into that subacromial space. So this force couple between the rotator cuff, um, primarily again the, the deltoid and the supraspinatus um, contracting together to help produce that, that elevation. Okay, so really the, the supraspinatus and the deltoid will help work with the elevation while the other rotator cuff muscles will actually help pull down the humeral head and allow it to rotate. Therefore, you're not going to get um, that impingement at the shoulder. So the combination of these two, the, the muscle synergies at the glenohumeral joint, the muscle synergy at the, the scapula thoracic joint, help to provide for, for functional elevation. And again, when we start to see, again, shoulder pathologies, it's one of the first things we, we, you know, we kind of start to look at to make sure that these, these muscles are all working together the way they should be. So more looking at the, kind of some of like the kinetic concepts and muscle actions that are taking place here. So we look at moment arm lengths. So 
obviously, again, just like any other muscle, we had talked about this in, in, in discussing muscle activity and strength, the, the maximum amount of torque that will get produced at the shoulders when the muscles are contracted from a resting position. Part of really what goes on in the movement between the scapula and the rotator, the, the, the scapula movement helps to maintain length tension relationships at the rotator cuff. Okay, so that allows for, again, optimal movement to kind of take place at the glenohumeral joint. So, for instance, when we, when we look at what goes on with shoulder elevation, so as we discussed previously, the leverage of the supraspinatus at the beginning of motion is actually greater than the deltoid. Okay, remember again, if the deltoid were just to contract really strong at the beginning of the motion, which it's not even really in a position to do so, you wouldn't, you would, you would again have that translation of the humeral head. The supraspinatus actually provides greater leverage at the beginning of the motion. Now obviously as the arm starts to go through the range, the deltoid then starts to increase its ability to then rotate the glenohumeral joint or move the glenohumeral joint rather. So again, if we're just looking at straight abduction as our example here, okay? So if you're elevating the shoulder in, into abduction, the beginning of the motion, the primary leverage is gonna come from the supraspinatus. After a certain point in the range of motion, the deltoid will start to increase because you're starting to increase the moment arm of the deltoid. So if you kind of picture um, moving the arm into abduction and that moment arm of the deltoid starting to increase, more, um, more torque will start to come through the deltoid as you move into greater greater positions of abduction. And at those points, then the supraspinatus will then help to work to just kind of keep the, the humeral head depressed as it kind of rotates it at the, at the joint. So, and again, what's gonna be happening here is, again, length tension relationships become very important and the scapula helps to maintain that. So this, by the, having the scapula move, that's gonna help keep all these muscles at optimal lengths to permit them to work through the range of motion. So that's an important thing to look at here when you're looking at the interaction between scapulothoracic movement and glenohumeral motion is to have the, again, the scapula moving through its motion at, at with good timing to permit the humerus to move through the range of motion that it has to go through. And here what we're looking at, um, so again, we, we talked about moment arm and what's important there, but here we're looking at the, the peak torque ratio. So with this, all, all we're gonna discuss here is basically looking at um, what are kind of the, the normal ratios between the, the different muscles. So in other words, what's, you know, basically what we're looking at here is which, which motion's gonna be stronger. So we look at the medial versus the lateral rotators. They say that the peak torque ratio is about three to two, three medial, two lateral rotators. So obviously we know we're, we're typically stronger into medial or internal rotation versus lateral rotation. So the peak ratio there is three to two. Adductor to abductor is a, is a two to one ratio with the adductors being stronger. And then the extensors to the flexors is a five to four ratio. So again, this is just something that's again, kind of measured through like isokinetic um, forces. So these are what we kind of look at for, for peak torque ratios. So obviously the medial rotators, the adductors and the extensors of the shoulder are stronger than the lateral rotators, abductors and flexors based upon those different ratios that we found out. And that's kind of like the optimal ratio again for, for normal functioning. Obviously we don't want, for instance, we don't want the internal rotators to completely overpower the lateral rotators. So in other words, we want a certain degree, even though we know that these ratios aren't all one to one, but we don't want the, the, the dominant muscles to become overly dominant because then that's where you're gonna run into different pathologies. So here's what I want you to do now. I'm not gonna do anything with this. When we get into class, 
um, we'll kind of use these pictures as discussion points and for some in-class assignments. So the, the next two illustrations, I just kind of want you to look at and think about what's, what's possibly going wrong or, or what could be happening, just sort of based off of some of the things that, that, that we had talked about um, through, throughout the throughout the video. So take a, a, a few seconds to kind of look at this one and then I'll, I'll pull up the, the next picture for you to look at as well. And here's the here's the next slide. So um, take a look at this. I won't I won't leave the recording on as long. Just if you want to kind of pause it and take a look at it yourself, kind of think about what what some of the what the what the issue here would be. And again, this will be something that we do we do talk about in class when we meet. But kind of just take a look at that and see what uh, what you think would be going on. In conclusion, again, these are your, your learning outcomes for the section. Again, I'm going to encourage everybody to go back and also review anatomy. Your textbook has some really great illustrations of the anatomy. It actually gives palpation points, the different ways to palpate some of the different muscles. And, and the, like I said, the illustrations are really good. I think it would do everybody good to do that. There's also different tables in the book that outline the different motions. What are the muscles that work together to produce the motions? What are the antagonists? Um, I think it would do everybody well to, to really go back and review that. Um, so make sure you kind of take a look at that, that point as well. Again, you, you will be responsible for knowing um, anatomy and knowing function of the, the muscles um, for, for both in class purposes and for testing purposes.